As you know, and as you might have picked up, we are a family on a mission, trusting God for three different ways of engaging our community. And I want to show you these three different areas. Me as an individual, wherever I find myself, my question is on three different levels. Reaching the lost, healing the pain, and restoring what's broken. Alan Platt, the visionary leader of Doxado, helped us in just coining these phrases. If we're saying we said it changes, if God called you and me to have an impact on a community, what do we do? And if, if we find these three areas as part of the ways we engage with people around us, it gives a very strong connection point to what Christians are actually called to do. Last week, Rick and Melinda shared with us about healing the pain. How can we be whole? Trusting God that through His Word, through what He says about you, we can be whole people. And we can minister that wholeness. We can see another brother and sister and say, you know what? Where you find yourself broken in your life with sadness, with hurt, with pain as a result of circumstances or sin or whatever, you can be whole in God. We can minister that. You can be the one representing that. The Holy Spirit in you at work. Next week, we're going to talk about restoring what's broken. Trusting that God will show us what solutions do you and me carry for this nation that we can bring? How do we change a city to see what is broken, support it, and see how now it's healed and restored and realigned with what God wants? But today we're going to talk about reaching the lost. Reaching the lost. What is our role to play? The people that don't know Jesus, what do we do about it? And I trust that there's something in your heart happening with mine to what God is saying to us. I want to show you a picture that's been circulated on social media a few times. Look at this dress. Whom of you have seen this dress? Um, Okay. This is an interesting one because people have posted this dress and said, what color do you see? Now, whom of you sees blue and black? Who sees anything else? few people. Okay, now the next picture is the two variations that people see. And they were unsure what the real color of the dress was. So some people said, you know what, no, it's definitely not black and blue, it's something else. Okay, look at the next one. This one came up last week again. I think it came up to, who saw this? I mean, there's famous trainers, these ones. It's tackies like you never believe. Okay, who see gray and like aqua blue kind of ish. Who sees pink? <laughs> really? So look at the next picture. So I don't know what you see on the left and the right. These, I can see blue and gray. And the left one is pink and white. Do, to whom do they look the same? Really? Fascinating. So which one is it then? So that to me is two different pictures. Some of you see the same thing. It's an interesting phenomenon. And I've read about it. Depending on how your brain interprets colors, the angle at which the photo was taken with the lighting around it, the projector's globe, the phone that you watch it on, there are so many peripherals that changes the picture we see. We see different pictures, but those are actually the same shoes. So, people are now saying, it's whatever you think it is. I'm saying, no, they exist. They are a color. But we see them differently. When I looked at this this week, I thought, isn't that amazing? When we talk about God, the different things surrounding the idea or reality of God changes how you see God. We know that. We've got so many different Ways of approaching Christianity even. Never mind all the other different religions. And even though there I believe is one true God. Your perspective regarding God or who he might be to you. Is influenced by how you grew up. Experiences you've had. Either in affirmation or in conflict of the idea of God. Does it mean though. That we can create our own truth. This relevant truth idea you get all over the world. You decide what's true for you. 
You can choose whatever color that dress is. Regardless of it, it's there. It's got a color. But no, you can choose. You can even choose your gender. We know that discussion in the world going on. You can choose everything. So truth is relative to your opinion, what makes you feel comfortable. Because when something is actually true and you don't like it, the discomfort, we're saying we don't want to be discomfortable as people, uncomfortable. Discomfort is not godly. I want to feel okay. I choose what is true for me. And haven't we become so displaced in our way of understanding ultimate truth that we diluted everything about what God is? You know what? You do what you want to do. My truth is my truth. We don't want to confront. We don't want to be incorrect in whatever way. It's like the understanding of grace and love has come at the cost of truth. I, I, I should not offend. So I'd love you and leave you to believe whatever you want, regardless of how destructive it might be. I was in a situation a few weeks ago when I spoke to a dad at a school function. And um, he told me, I asked him about his, his faith. He's, he's from an um, Eastern Far East country originally his family and he said no they're not Christians they've got one of the um, majority Asian faiths um, but his son is in a Christian school and I said okay how do you do this you know you're not a Christian he is in a Christian school he said no his boy actually is a Christian now I said that's wonderful any conflict no it doesn't bother him because all religions teach people to do good things so he's okay with that for a split second, so was I. <laughs> to my absolute shock, I said, you, you're right. Why? And then I was, hang on. Can, is, is this what God is all about? Are we suddenly reducing the goodness of people, saying, you know what? My religion, teach me not to do bad things and love you. Why do you want to change me? My color dress is pink and blue and yours is green and red. Why do you, what's the issue? And we feel it's a noble thing to say, you know what, you're right. What works for you, works for you. Let's not accept that there is one truth only. And I was confronted in that very moment. I said, Lord, how do I answer him? How do I tell him, you know what, it's interesting that you would say that. But can I, can I tell you what I believe is the ultimate truth about what religion and the God, the one God that I believe is the only God say? Can I share with you why it makes sense to me? Can I share with you the conviction, the hope that I have about the Savior, Jesus Christ? Or is it somebody else's responsibility with this evangelistic calling and looking around saying, Guys, evangelist, this guy needs you. Or I just pray for him, which is a good thing. Because God changes people on his own, but he wants to use us. The issue that I have and that I sat with after that conversation with him is it's indisputable. Matthew 5, verse 13 to 14 says, I am the salt and the light to the world. God is using us. I don't have to look around because I am that one. So if I am the one that brings out the, the colors and the taste of people because God uses me, then what is my responsibility? What is it that drives me, that compels me to say, if, if I am called to do this, what do I do in that moment? Do I just leave a relative truth and you go and do whatever you do, leaving people to destroy themselves? Or do I want to share this conviction that there's only one God? I don't know how many of you have, um, know this quote that's claimed to be said by St. Francis of Assisi. Always proclaim the gospel and when necessary use words. It was powerful when it came out. Because it said that whatever you do must radiate God, not words only because I think it came out of a season where it was easy to speak but what we lived like didn't look like our speech the truth is he never said it it's a nice quote these words were never said by him what he actually said was and I put it on the screen for you it is no use walking anywhere to preach unless our walking is our preaching Maybe somebody summarized it. My issue with the first statement that he made was, in my life, if I'm honest, and if maybe some of you shared that with me, maybe I'm the only one. The first statement was a little cop-out. If you can't see in my life that Jesus lives, it's not my fault. I'm not using words. 
Only when necessary. And I don't see it necessary. And I'm hoping that what I'm doing will create some stirring in people. So you're different. And God is using that 100%. But when necessary, use words. And I don't think I was that necessary to use words. And I really feel convicted that God is leading us into a time where we have to refocus and saying, Lord, but have I got the ability to say who Jesus is? If someone goes to, to Mark and say, Mark, the way that you live your life, brother, wow, what is it that, w- that lives in you? Because obviously you're immune to some of the challenges in the world. Mark, I want you to tell me. What is, what is it that we're going to say in that very moment? How can a country like South Africa be divided and struggle with hopelessness and desperation when so many Christ followers are walking? 70, 80 percent, we don't know. How is it that we are struggling with so much wondering about if this nation is safe for us to live in? Why are so many people leaving the country? Why are so many people desperately trying to fight for themselves? If we're saying we've got the answer, but we need to tell people that Jesus has whatever it takes for us to stay here. Or if you're called to go, to go. But to live with the peace of God and with the knowledge of salvation. That destruction in our lives we do not have to sit with anymore. That we're not victims to sin anymore. Or do I really hope that people will somewhere have this big calling that I will never have. And do it on my behalf. If you are that person this morning, like I was years ago, that I have to hear this and just take a moment to say, Lord, I'm not sure that, you know, I will be able to say it because I don't even know that I believe it for myself. I want to encourage you, if you're here this morning and you're at a place where you're saying, I can't bring hope to others that I don't have myself. I'm a victim of my own brokenness and the things that I've said, the things that I've done the destruction I've caused in family or in workplace or in life, wherever. Can I just tell you this morning, don't allow this morning to pass. Will you take a moment and you're saying, Lord, can you just come and restore me? Can you come and just take my life and take my brokenness and replace it with your wholeness? And I, I just feel that we take a moment and pray. If that's you, don't you want to just surrender to God? Lord, I want to pray in the middle of this message now. Saying, Lord, don't you want to come for the people sitting here this morning that says, I need Jesus. My life is empty and I need the Savior of the world, the King of kings and the Lord of lords that gave his life on the cross to become real for me in this very moment. Lord, I pray that you will come and as they say, render their lives to you, Lord, that you would come and touch them, affirm to them that as they confess their sins, that you come and you wash clean, and you then make them children of God. I pray the people sitting here watching online that says, yes, I need God today, this very moment. In the name of Jesus, receive Him. And know that you belong to God. The moment you say, yes, Lord, I give my life to you. And I pray, Lord, that the testimonies of those responding in this moment will be received with great joy in their families and in their places of engagement in the week. Thank you, Jesus, for this. Amen. 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 I want to ask you a few questions as we discuss what God is doing. Um, questions we must face. In every, is every Christian compelled to share the gospel? Are certain people not called to be the ones who are sent and the rest are just prayer warriors? Are we all sitting with that responsibility? Is there a difference between an evangelist and a normal Christian just testifying of God's goodness? Let me read to you 1 Peter 3. Two scriptures um, that we have to read. But you know, before I do that, I'll read you Romans. Romans 10 verse 9 to 15 that says, If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. As the scriptures tell us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. 
For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's what we believe. And then it says, but how can they call on Him to save them unless they believe in Him? And how can they believe in Him if they never heard about Him? And how can they hear about Him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, How beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news. Paul writes to the Romans and he said, Listen, it's great for people to believe in God. It changed their lives, but how can they? How can they call upon Him if they don't know about Him, if no one tells them? And that's why the question is real to us. What is it that we have to do in telling other people about God? Second scripture in 1 Peter 3 verse 3 to 16. Now, who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats, other people, if you want to do good things. It says, instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. Always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people, ask, uh, if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Peter is saying, guys, it's great to live lives that are renewed by God, but be ready to explain in a few words what it is that's true. What is the true color of truth? Regardless of what you see, what is the real thing? There was a survey done in the previous season when we talked about Monday morning atheists, and they asked, what are the 10 spiritual work issues that people deal with? And I put them on there. It's maybe a little small to read, but it's fascinating that four out of the 10 things that people struggle with is exactly this thing, not being able to respond when people are saying, hey, what's happening in your life? Why is Jesus important to you? Look what people say. Those four questions, the smaller ones not as much related to. But the second one was, I am not comfortable taking appropriate opportunities at work to discuss my faith beliefs. Not comfortable. It's an issue people face, you and I. It's people within Doxado that filled these in. The fourth one is, in my work decisions and interactions with people, God is really top of my mind. I'm not ready. It's not really part of my thinking about what I'm doing. So how can I share if it's not a reality I'm even aware of? The sixth one is, I struggle to express why Jesus is the center of my life and work. Struggle to do that. Maybe even don't think I should do that. Second from the bottom says, it's difficult for me to talk about Jesus in a clear and natural way at work. There's something that creeped into the Christian's mindset that said that perhaps Look at your Lord, use my deeds and the way that I do life, which is a powerful testimony. But then be ready just to communicate that. And I think it's time just to be trained again on how do we actually engage it? How do we find ourselves being so convicted of this truth that we do not allow people to go without knowing what it's done to our lives, not to condemn, not to judge, hear me correctly, it's not going in the old Bible bashing, you will do what God is saying, it is inspiring people with the same truth that change our lives, and being able to say, why is it true for us? I've invited Clinton just to join me on stage, Clinton's got a great testimony of, of this whole thing taking hold of his walk with God, so Clinton, don't you want to join me? Morning. Morning, Clinton, oh, you're greeting them, oh, that's good, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, Clinton, we've been journeying a while now. You can take a seat. I'm going to sit as well. Thanks. I've invited Clinton just because I think it's been burning in his heart. And Clinton, I want you to, to continue the conversation with me this morning. Yeah. Um, because God has been using you in a way that surprised, I think, yourself and all of us in a fascinating way. Um, but I want, I want this morning something of what God has been doing through your conviction of exactly this topic. So come and just tell her how God has done it. But before we go into the detail of that, maybe just quickly, I think many of us know you, but just your journey of faith. How did you meet God? When did it happen? Just quickly share with us that we know what the background is. <laughs> okay, I'm going to try and give you the short version. But I was saved in 2010. 
um, during the Soccer World Cup at that stage. And um, uh, one of the things that happened is uh, I had some dreams, so God was prompting me to start reading the Word. And while also re starting to just open the Bible, Genesis started reading, um, I was also watching some DVD sermons, um, Andy Stanley and um, Louis Giglio, and they've got did a series together called History. His story is the pun that they used there. And um, they, they conclude that DVD uh, just telling the story how that we are here for God's glory. That's the purpose of our lives. Mm. And uh, I finished that DVD series, and I just realized, wow, my life has a purpose. It's to glorify God. Mm. And um, so, so just with that, I told my wife, Bidet, I told her, listen, we need to find a church. Mm. And uh, ironically, he sent us to Doxa Deo, the glory of God. <laughs> mm -hmm. He's got a human. I only found that out like two years ago. Oh, what a coincidence. <laughs> coincidence, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's how I got saved. Fantastic. Now... There was a specific, as we grow in our faith, understanding more of the Word of God and our relationship with Him, there was a point where you were confronted with sharing the gospel. You know? um, and as I said earlier, that I think many of us, and myself as well, was wondering, is evangelism, which means to bring the gospel to people, is that for everyone? Is it only for certain people? Is it a gifting? Is it a responsibility? How did you grapple with that Discussion in your early you know, time of growing in your faith. Mm. So, so right from being saved, I, I had this passion in me to just go change the world and tell everybody, did you know Jesus loves you? Do you know how, mm. that we are here for a purpose, for, for living for God's glory? I, I had that, that thing in me just to go, you know, I wanted to go slap people, just wake up. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, God actually took me through a process, uh, also just listening to some sermons, and I kept on getting this message, Clinton, calm down, calm down. You need to just mellow a little bit. <laughs> And then I'll use, you know, Moses was in the desert 40 years, so just, just relax. And um, uh, so, so I was grappling with that thing. And, and for many years, uh, you know, going to church, hearing the message that your life needs to be uh, telling the story, you know, like the, that uh, CC uh, dude. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, and that, that's good. Your life needs to testify. Of, of God and, and His goodness. When people look at you, you need to be faultless and uh, you need to be carry, carrying that message in your heart that, yes, I am a representative of God. But then um, through the adopter shop thing that happened, uh, Louis Albertine, those who know, um, he's got it on his heart to share the gospel in the mall because we are a church in the mall here. And um, I started just attending with him and, and seeing how prayer walking works, you know, just walking with him and we pray and we meet people and, and uh, just, it's just befriending people. It's an intentional sort of thing. Mm. And that's where I, uh, uh, God awakened in me the gifting that he gave me of evangelism. So, yes, there is a gifting of evangelism. Um, but I am convinced, just like that scripture, if, if we don't tell people, how will they know? It's, mm. uh, it's a calling on all of us to where we can intentionally, with, with our words, share Jesus with people. Mm. Be intentional about it, yeah. Mm. Now, you learned in a way or awakened to God being able to use everyone. Um, yes, and I think I agree with you. You get people like Billy Graham and the big evangelist. That's got a specific gifting on that, but... The disciples were sent out, and we believe when God sent them, uh, just before he ascended to heaven, he said, go to all the nations, mm. you guys. Yeah. And they are not with us anymore, those disciples, so I hope that the rest of us pick that up <laughs> as a calling for us all. But then, when you started believing that, how did you start executing it in practical ways in your everyday life? Mm. So I remember being frustrated at work for many years, uh, wanting to, uh, you know, tell people and, and get them to, to understand how much God loves them, that, that thing of uh, planting seed with them. And, and I was frustrated for years, you know, trying to be this example, but I didn't have the words. I didn't have the practical ways of, uh, you know, confronting people. And, 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 and giving, delivering them the gospel. So, so something that God just blessed me with was uh, I was keep on searching for ways to do this. And I went to YouTube. I was watching a lot of YouTube clips, Ray Comfort, uh, Todd White, those sort of guys, uh, uh, doing what's called street evangelism. But if you ask them, they say, no, street evangelism, that, that's a silly term. It, it's just being a Christian. Mm. Uh, Todd White carries that message. It's all of us need to carry the message of sharing Jesus with people. Um, uh, if we really care for them, if we're concerned about where they end up, why not run around and tell them, hey, 
do you know Jesus? Mm. So um, uh, through that, uh, I started acquiring some skills, asking some strategic questions to people uh, mm. about their faith. Just, just questions like, hey, do you go to church? What do you believe about God? Is there heaven? Is there hell? Those sorts of questions lead you into a bigger discussion about what Jesus did on the cross. Mm. But then you found a, a daily place to do that as you chose to not buy a car. Just tell us how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> so our business was struggling, and we had to sell uh, the second car, my, my car. And um, uh, we sold that car, and we didn't need it. We were we, working from home, so didn't really use it. But um, uh, by God's grace, when, when, when I started working at yeah, Doxa Deo, uh, now I suddenly need to, needed to travel. My wife needs a car. She needs to go to meetings. So I um, just opted for the, the Uber taxi uh, uh, option. So um, what turns out about that that's awesome, <laughs> it's about a 15-minute drive from, from my house to here, uh, to, to the life center. And turns out 15 minutes is enough time to share the gospel. <laughs> Um, so I just want to acknowledge someone that's here today. Gemotso uh, and his wife, uh, wife or fiance, I don't even know, Lefundo. Uh, I saw you guys earlier. Uh, yeah, there, there they said, just wave. <laughs> Hello, guys. You are so welcome. So Lefundo is a guy I shared the gospel with on Monday or Tuesday. I can't remember. And uh, he just, at the end of it, he's, he's such a, uh, his heart is open. And he said, well, what church do you go to? I said, well, Doc Sadeo, come visit us. And he's mm. here today. So Fantastic. welcome. welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so, so sharing the gospel, I found just being intentional about connecting with people. I mean, uh, you have to really care. You, it's not about climbing in the car and bashing someone saying, you know, do you know Jesus? Mm. Um, uh, God calls us to really care for people. Mm. So, so uh, like I did with Chumot as well, you know, you, you just get to know someone first before you um, uh, lead into the questions about God. It's such a natural way. That's what Jesus did. He cared, he loved, and he brought the truth. Mm. And I think sometimes when, when we take the one or the other, um, then the truth without the grace is, is not the full picture of what Jesus was. Mm. Um, and when we care and we are not able to say, you know, what is the truth about our conviction, then there's something missing out on that. But, but Clinton, in 15 minutes, to care, to connect, and share the gospel, how do you do it? <laughs> I mean, you ask those, some of those questions, but how do you get to, in such a short time, sometimes I think I need five years of relationship, you know, ten bries, um, <laughs> and then only they're open to you have a conversation. You, in 15 minutes... You don't do that, but you do that. I don't know what you do. Ray, Ray Comfort was my inspiration. He makes the point, and he says that, um, uh, yes, uh, I also believe in building relationship. So because someone could die that night, I quickly build two-minute relationship with them, <laughs> and I give them the gospel. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, so sometimes we mustn't be scared. I think if we can just throw off the fear of will people be intimidated? Will they, will, will they reject the message of me telling them about Jesus? And Tops, the, things that, the thing that really surprised me is, so I, these, these trips that I do with uh, Uber or Taxify, um, when I come to the end of that trip and I've shared the gospel with that person, 95% of the time that person turns to me and says, thank you, I didn't know this. Hmm. You know, um, something that, that really stirs with me as well is, uh, one guy I was talking to, um, uh, he, he said, yeah, no, he needs to pray for his business. I'm like, oh, okay, there's my lead in, into the, the God question. I'm like, oh, so you, you pray, are you a Christian? Yes, he says, I'm not just a Christian, I'm a disciple. He's got the band around his arm, what would Jesus do? You know, he probably had the shirt, all of that. And uh, I thought, okay, let's just ask some questions about this, you know. So he's a disciple. Uh, and, and I asked him, so, so if you die and you come to the gates of heaven, Jesus is standing there. He says, okay, um, um, Mr. Joe, why must I let you into heaven? And um, he answered and he said, well, I'm a good person. I go to, go to church. I give money to charity. I walk old ladies across the road. You know, all these things. I, 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 I do this. In who is he trusting? I, not Jesus. That's the, the gospel story is not trusting in, G, in, in, in I, in yourself, it's Jesus. Mm. So, so there's only two ways to answer that question. Why should God let you into heaven? It's either I or Jesus. Jesus, you paid with your blood for me to come into, mm. into heaven. And, and that's the gospel story that Jesus 
didn't leave us in our sins. He said, I'm going to come and I will pay that fine. Um, uh, the Ten Commandments is called the moral law. Mm. We all know, yeah, sitting here, we have broken that law. We are guilty. But God says, I paid the price for you. Mm. The fi- if, if, if I'm in court and someone, um, uh, you know, I've robbed the bank or whatever, and someone comes and they pay the fine on my behalf, then the judge could let me go. He could say, well, Clinton, I was going to send you to jail for 60 years. But someone's come, they've paid the fine, 200,000 rand fine, um, so you're out of here. You can go. Just go. You're free. What? So, so if someone else pays my fine, then I'm not guilty anymore. Mm. I'm free. God has paid my price. I'm a mm. child. I'm a son of God. Mm. He loves me that much, and my life has purpose. That is so important, and I think the, the issue that we're dealing with is the fact that the stat says 80% or 85 or how much, it is for real, we don't know, of people that believe to be Christians in this country, as somewhat of an underlying religious thinking that we can debate where it comes from. But if you press people long enough, you can quickly see, is it that there's something that I have done that justifies me, like you're saying, Mm. or is there a faith that Jesus paid the final price? Mm. And so many people, I think, live with that lie. And therefore, if we share faith, even with people who believe in Jesus, to just remind them of that price being paid. Yeah. It's like it's a calling for the church to take on again and say, guys, let's not strive on our own. Because when we do, we are disappointed. The devil comes in with accusation again. Say, oh, you're this good Christian. You're trying very hard. You didn't make it this week, did you now? <laughs> you know, so don't go to church. Don't be a light because you're, you're not worth it. Try harder next week. And this captivity has been reinforced where the price, like you say, has actually been paid. Yeah. Mm. One of my favorite verses is, is this in Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. It says, For by grace are you saved, through faith, and that not of yourself, it is a gift of God. Mm. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Sorry, this is King James, but um, Mm. it's it's, it's saying, don't trust in yourself. Mm. Trust in the one that's paid the price. And that's that's such a big message. That's the gospel. It's not you, it's him. Absolutely. I was so pleased when I searched a little bit how many scriptures... In the Bible, one verse summarizes the gospel. I've got a whole page of them like he was reading here. And I just put some of them up here. Um, and I want to encourage you. I mean, even if you want to take a picture of this now, I'm going to put it on Facebook and email it out. If I don't have your email address, then make sure the info desk has it because I'm going to send out this document. I've got a long page. This is a third of it that I just quickly found in the week. Scriptures that summarize the gospel, and you can choose one or two or three of them that you can memorize and use. If someone says, okay, but what is God all about? If you're thinking, "Mm, where do I start, where do I start? Take any scripture. Let's take the second one, Mark 10. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give His life as a ransom for many. That's who Jesus is. That's why I want to serve you. He gave His life for me. There's the message. There's the gospel in one verse. Um, second from last in Romans 4 he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification there's the gospel in one sentence in one verse and I was surprised that God I don't have to be able to recite the whole Bible I can just get some of these scriptures know them well and if someone says hey what's happening in your life and say you know what Jesus died for my life for my sin to be taken away and now I'm a new creation Did you just make it up? No, it's the Word of God. So it's eternally true. It can never come back empty. I want to read you one scripture, and then we're going to pray and just make sure that we respond to this. Philippians 4, verse 8 to 9. It says, And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. It's basically saying, fix your eyes on who God is. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. And then keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me. Everything you heard from me and saw me doing. That is Paul writing to the Philippians. Then the God of peace will be with you. He's saying, guys, whatever you've seen, whatever you've learned, whatever you've experienced, whatever you've come to be known to be true for you, keep practicing it. Get Find the spaces. Trust that God wants to use you. If, if someone told me, if, if I was challenged and said, listen, take taxis every day and God can use you to share the testimony of God in your life in 15 minutes, I would say, no way, man. I don't know if I can do that. I think we are in a way lamed. We, 
We lack faith that God can use us. We lack faith that in that opportunity that someone says something, that you go, there's my cue in. There's the opportunity. And the Holy Spirit, I guarantee, will be very faithful in creating those opportunities. Just two or three weeks ago, as we, as we were pondering this, I was saying, Lord, okay, in this week, I want to share the gospel with one person at least. God is so faithful. The very next morning, as I walked up here, now let me tell you my little journey. And Gunther, you can maybe join me so long. My little journey was walking up, and that guy was sitting on the little couch here, just in front of our sign against the wall. And as I walked past, I could feel the Holy Spirit say, that's him. He said, God, I'm late for a meeting. We're starting now. You know, I'm available at 10 o'clock. <laughs> Let my deeds show him. So here is how I crossed that silly boundary that I should have crossed permanently many years ago. And I walked back and I looked at him and he was reading something. I said, God, he's busy. I can't interrupt this guy. I have respect for other people. And I could hear God smiling. I don't know how that happened. I could hear him smiling. So I walked back and I pretended like there's something wrong with the sign. So here I am looking at the screws, you know, <laughs> praying, Lord, please, no, please, please. Walking around the corner and just walked around back, fourth time. Said, listen, brother, God is just putting in my heart. I must pray with you and ask you how you are. Oh, sit down. I would love to speak to you. What is it you believe about God? Oh, no, he's with me. But what do you mean? And I could share with him what I believe God is doing. What a great conversation pray together. God is very faithful in that. And I want to stir you with the hope that God can use you as well. And I want to ask that you stand with me as we trust in God for those opportunities. So I don't want to say those of you feel that God can use you. The Bible says it's all of us. And I want to just bless you with a sense of trust and hope, believing that God can use you. Do you want to stand with me as we're praying this morning? Lord, I'm standing, the first one here with everyone else, maybe watching online, if you want to stand as well. Lord, it is phenomenal that we carry this wonderful good news of Jesus, the Savior of the world, true for us. We carry the reality of lives being transformed for eternity, prepared to be with you, but in this life reigning with you, not a victim of brokenness, not a victim of a broken world, not a victim of our sin or our bad decisions, People made free, made whole. We carry this news. We know what color the truth is. Your word is true. You are true. Nothing else can change it, Lord. Not any other discussion or relevant truth to people. There's one true God. It is you. We, we carry that, Lord. And as our lives want to align in every way with your word of God, as we read your word and say, Lord, journey with us. Teach us. Sanctify us. Help us, Lord, that our thinking will be at on good, admirable, uplifting things to keep doing and practicing what you taught us through your word. Lord, that is true for all of us standing. And Lord, I want to pray that you would stir in us right now, Holy Spirit, the hope, the faith, the anticipation, the excitement. God, you can use me. You can show me an opportunity to just to say, Jesus loves you. That is the gospel in three words. Lord, to, to share forgiveness, to tell of the love of God that transforms lives, to testify of what happened in our lives and being able to share our testimony, to know the scriptures that just summarize the word of God so well in what Jesus came to do, what you came to do for us. Lord, I'm so excited about the testimonies that will come back and say, in my workplace where I never thought it's possible, there at home, there in school, there with his kids, or whatever I'm doing, where I never thought it's possible, you used me to just share something of this truth. And it set people free. Because now they know. Now they believe. Now they can call out to you. Lord, I want to bless everyone standing here with that hope and anticipation. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will mightily move in us. That our hearts will be awakened every morning with the excitement of what will it be today, Lord? Where will you use me today, Lord, regardless of what I think my limitations are? I pray that everyone will be blessed with that hope, that power, Lord. The Word of God is true. It's, re it's liberating. It's making people free. 
an opportunity we have to partner with what you're doing, Lord. Making your love visible and known to people around us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. As you're standing, there's something that the, the Word of God is saying about being commissioned. When Jesus was praying over the disciples, commissioned them, He said, you guys, go. Go and do it. Go and be the representatives. Be sent to be the carriers of this message. And last week we invited people from media and education to be commissioned in our prayer lounge. And people came and were commissioned just being saying, hey, you, go now. We pray a blessing over you. And this morning to close our service, we, we thought let's invite people to come and be commissioned this morning. There's, there's something powerful in that moment when a dad commissions his son or his daughter or when a senior person in a company commissions a person who's raising up some kind of responsibility to say, hey, I agree that you can do it. Now go and do it. And this morning especially, we want to identify people in business and in sport. And you can see all these different things, science and technology, sport, fitness, people who are managing or whatever communication you're in. Or maybe you missed last week. Or maybe you won't be here next week for whatever reason, but be here. But if you're here this morning and, and you know you fall in that category, we are convinced, I'm convinced that the moment we say we anoint you for that work, that something activates in your spirit. And you know that you're commissioned, you are carrying that mandate to do that. So what we want you to do is to be very uncomfortable in terms of space, but move forward and come and stand here. I want to pray a commissioning prayer over you and leaders are ready to anoint you. There's oil here and it's symbolic of just God covering you with that favor and that power and we want to just anoint you. And if you are here and you know God is calling you in that place or maybe in some other area of media or education, you haven't been here last week, if everybody has to stand here, that's fine. And we have time. We're not about time yet. You can relax. Don't you want to come forward? We want to make a moment right now. Come and stand here and we're going to pray. You can move forward right now. If you're watching online, we know that you are there. We're going to pray for you as well. Come stand here at the front, and we're going to be ready to pray for people and commission people this morning. It's a spiritual moment of significance, and we want to make sure that we take effort in making that count.